Ja, <laughs> wow, I love that film. <laughs> it makes me so happy. It makes me laugh. I didn't think this was cheesy. <laughs> I certainly didn't think they were going to keep it in there, but, you know, it was fun. Okay, so Mark Johnson and Whitney Cronkey, congratulations. Thank you. Thank it's you. such an honor to sit here next to you guys and just thinking about the whole legacy that you created with Playing for Change. Um, we're going to talk a bit more about the whole idea of Playing for Change, where that came from, and obviously these years with this work, all the people you met, places you've been, and a little bit about the future. Um, but I just want to say hi. My name is Ami Brammesi. I'm a freelance journalist here in Sweden. And I uh, have a podcast, a feminist and anti-racist podcast called Raserzet. And uh, yeah, <laughs> it's, called, it's called sort of the rage, but we laugh a lot as well. Uh, and uh, when I just heard of uh, Playing for Change the first time, I was truly amazed about the way that you make an actual change uh, for these kids, obviously. But I, I want to go back in time before you started in back in 2000 with you two guys and your uh, connection to music and the love of music. Can you just tell us a little bit about your own relationship to music? Maybe you want to start. Sure. Well, first, hello, everybody. What an amazing honor to be here. And we're representing so many people that have supported us throughout the years. So I just wanted to say thanks on behalf of all of them. And yeah, so music was... Uh, you know, is the vehicle that we use to unite people around the world. I think I first, I mean, I grew up listening to music and it was always a big part of my life. I then went on to the University of New Hampshire where I was an interpersonal communication major. And there we would study how do people make sense of the world? How do they create their identity? Because if you can learn how other people make sense of the world, you can make a better connection with them. And then after the university, I got a job in New York City at the Hit Factory at a recording studio. And one day I would go to work and I would record music with Biggie Smalls. And the next day I would go to work and it would be a 70-piece orchestra. Wow. And then the next day it would be Paul Simon. And every day I would watch the joy these musicians had. And then I would see them go home to completely different worlds. And I used to think, wow, if they could see what I see in each of them, they would probably all be best friends. Mm -hmm. And so I started to see that music has this ability to really bring out joy, regardless of who you are or where you come from. And then I was on my way to work one day, and there were two monks painted all in white with robes on. One of them was playing a nylon guitar. The other one was singing. I don't know the language. I imagine most people didn't know the language. But on this day in a New York City subway, the whole platform stopped. Mm. Nobody got on the train. And everybody's watching this music. And I just looked around, and I saw a homeless man next to a businessman. And I saw a little girl next to an elderly woman. And during this performance, they were so connected to this music. Mm. So I learned really two lessons in that experience. One, the best music I heard in my life was on the way to the studio and not in the <laughs> studio. And the other great experience from that was that when the music plays, the things that, div that divide us in life, they disappear. And so we can use music as a tool to reconnect people back to their shared humanity. Mm. So based on that, we had the idea, you know, to use music as a way to go deeper and to find a way to reconnect people all over the world. And Whitney, Whitney, I suppose you didn't have the exact same. I did not have the exact same. <laughs> um, I grew up in, um, hi everyone, first of all. Um, it's so, so great to be here. It, it's just surreal and, and so special. Um, now, I grew up in the middle of America in Missouri, state of Missouri. Um, and I was a dancer my whole life. So for me, my relationship with music was really physical. And... It was also a means of like escape and exploration because I came from a predominantly, you know, white American town in smack in the middle of the country. And um, I, I grew up dancing. It took me various places. Los Angeles is actually where I ended up um, with dance after going to school in Chicago to study theater. And I was in 
London actually doing a, a play when I was in my early 20s and was working with a bunch of actors that had studied mime in Paris. And we got to talking a lot about people that did performance on the street. Mm -hmm. And to me, it was just such a brave thing to do. Like, I couldn't imagine being right in front of your audience performing and the, the, the experience of that is so intimate. And so we just, it was something we talked about and um, pondered and I was speaking to a friend back home in LA about it and he said, you know, when you get back from London, there's somebody I want you to meet. That's my friend Mark. I just think you guys would get along because he really has, he's really interested in street music and street musicians. Mm and kind of finding a way to record these musicians live instead of taking a musician and putting them, isolating them in the mm -hmm. studio to keeping, keep this like shared experience. And so months later when I got back to LA, um, Mark and I met for a coffee and that was kind of that. We, we decided by the end of the meeting, uh, whatever you want to call it, a meeting, uh, you know, meet and greet, a hello, that we were <laughs> gonna try to make this film um, and so Playing for Change actually started as a, as a documentary film mm. on street musicians in the United States. Mm. And uh, it has grown, <laughs> obviously, exponentially yeah. since this uh, early idea uh, in about year 2000-ish. Yeah. yeah. So, well, that's amazing. Yeah. So, and then uh, around 2007, mm -hmm. this whole idea from the uh, documentary filming and the videos mm -hmm. became playing for change and mm -hmm. you established the whole foundation that we mm -hmm. know today of uh, playing for change. Mm -hmm. uh, so can you tell us a bit more about establishing the foundation and uh, starting to work with the schools? Mm -hmm. Can we start? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, so as we were making the songs around the world, which was, we, first we built a mobile recording studio and at the time we powered it with golf cart batteries and then car batteries, um, and then little battery packs. Now, how would this look? <laughs> yeah. Well, in the beginning, it, it was looked very big. Clumsy <laughs> in the beginning, yeah. Big and heavy. Yeah. Um, but it was a way to bring a world class studio to the people. Yeah. And we decided to take the project. We had done the cinematic discovery of street musicians across America. Mm -hmm. And when we were starting that project, instead of just recording the musicians in their own environments, Whitney was pushing me to say, listen, we need to go deeper. What else can we do? And one day in the middle of the night, I woke up and I was like, well, it's just what we do in the recording studio. We can have them all play on the same song in different places. So we first had made a song across America, and the guitar solo was trading between Venice Beach and in front of a fish market in Harlem. Oh. And we just started to realize how amazing this was yeah. to have these people in their own environments playing music together. So we decided what, we should try to take this around the world, but we would need the right song. And I was walking down the street in Santa Monica and I heard a street musician named Roger Ridley singing the song, Stand By Me. And I think I was a few streets away and I still heard his voice, I ran over to watch this performance. And I approached him and I said, Roger, with a voice like yours, I mean, you sound like Otis Redding. What are you doing singing on the street? And he said, man, I'm in the joy business. I come out to bring joy to the people. <laughs> and this guy singing the song, Stand By Me, I remember asking him, you know, hey, can we come back, record you, film you playing Stand By Me, then we're going to travel the world, put headphones on musicians. And he looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> but he said, hey, if you come back, I'll play the song. And that sort of led to the beginning of our journey of taking Playing for Change and going around the world. Again, going back to the roots of learning how do they make sense of the world, what role does music play in their society, and then adding them all on to the same song so they could be a part of something special together. And as we started the traveling, Whitney had said to me, you know, these people, they're inviting us in their homes, they're feeding us, they're playing their music, telling their stories, keeping us safe. We need to give back to them. We need to ask, you know, what could we do to give back to these communities? Mm -hmm. So when we went down to South Africa, I had uh, been given a book by my brother, Greg Johnson, called A Day in the Life of Africa. And in, he had one of the, the pictures in this book framed for me. And it was musicians playing in the ghetto in South Africa in a township. And they looked so soulful. They looked amazing. And we said, we didn't even know what they were playing, but we said, <laughs> we got to go find those guys. So we went to South Africa. And the only thing we could 
discover at that time online was that the leader of the band, he was the bass player, and his name was Pokey. Pokey, so, not even a last Pokey. name. Pokey. Pokey. So okay. we would ask everybody, you know, does anybody know Pokey? It seems, <laughs> seems so funny today. In and Africa. most people, yeah. most people didn't know him. Uh. But one day this guy jumped up and he said, Pokey, he's my best friend. <laughs> and he said, I'll take you to meet him. So we get in a van and we drive from Cape Town through all the tin shacks into uh. the township. And because I've had Pokey on my wall for years, he's like a hero of mine. So he comes out of his house, and I run up to him to give him a <laughs> hug, you know. And he's like, who are you? What are you doing here? And, and then uh, at the time, it was an iPod video. So I would have an iPod, and I would be able to show them where Stand By Me was at that time. And we were going there to add Pokey on bass to Stand By Me. And I remember I gave him the iPod and the headphones, and I walked into the backyard and it was a bunch of really, really small little shacks. And at that time, they had such a high rate of HIV and such extreme poverty. So when I looked in the backyard, I said, oh, no, this is a bad idea. This place is really, really sad. And I felt like, wow, we've gone too far. But he's inside watching the video, calling all his friends and saying, come on over, come on over. You got to see this project. And the next thing we know, they set up the music and they start to play. And... We look around, and it transformed from the saddest place I'd ever seen to the happiest place I'd ever seen. And the only thing that changed was that they were playing music. Mm. So we realized that music is deeper than we, is, is as deep as we can go, you know? There is no situation that music cannot help to transform into something positive. Mm. So we realized the power of music in that experience. And in that context, we said, Pokey, what can we do to give back to you? Yeah. And I remember him saying, you know, the kids here, they need a music school because maybe the child becomes the next, instead of being a gangster, maybe they become the next Nelson Mandela. And maybe the only thing that changes is that somebody believes in them. Mm -hmm. So it was really born out of one individual, look people in the eyes, see how they make sense of the world, and give them a chance, mm -hmm. one person at a time. And that was the exact same spot as the base on Stand By Me and also as our very first music school. Mm. So it became an opportunity to now combine our efforts where we could make music, but we could also directly give back to the individual communities that we were meeting along the way. Mm. You guys are allowed to clap. <laughs> it is really <laughs> it's a good story. No, it's a <laughs> And I'm, and I'm wondering about the schools. Mm -hmm. How did you do to get to finance the schools? Because obviously you must have, I mean, you need people, you need money to yeah. do this. How did you do the actual yeah, work? Yeah, I mean, we've, we fundraise um, kind of, you know, traditional uh, in America back in, you know, 11 years ago, 12 years ago when we started the foundation side of it, we've created a charity, a, you know, a legal charity so that people can make donations. Mm. Um, and so we've, you know, done everything from, you know, in a lot of individual donations to yeah. bigger grants and, and things like that. When we, when we went to South Africa, you know, Mark and I have been doing this project for so long. It's our, it's our life. And, you know, a lot of what we've done is because we were so young and didn't really have any of the voices in our head saying, maybe you mm. shouldn't do that. We just said, okay, we're going to do it. You know, <laughs> we're going to go to South Africa and build a school. And we figured it out when we get there. And, um, and we did that exact thing. Um, we worked with, we just would talk to the locals, you know. I think what makes us unique in certain ways and is that, you know, we're not coming in with our idea of what their programs should look like or their schools should look like or their education should look like or their curriculum. Um, you know, we, we talk to people and there and, and see what they would like to do and work with them to build it. So, you know, that one, we, we really piecemealed that together. Then we had, a, you know, an, a better idea of what mm. <laughs> it cost mm. after, to, after to do that. But it, it's all different. You know, we, we work with each local community um, and their local resources and hire local people and, mm. and do all of that to get, to get the things built that need to get built. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And what challenges have you met through throughout these years? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, uh, there's a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's interesting because music is is such an equalizing uh, force. Mm. So when you go in under 
um, with the, under the, the, end, the umbrella of music, wanting mm -hmm. to share music with people or play music with people or record their music, it opens up a lot of, it opens up a lot of trust, actually, and you're able to have honest discussions. But, you know, we've gone into places and, and been like, we were, you know, Mark had found this village in mm -hmm. Mali. And how did you find Karina? Because they sent us an email saying, um, okay. music school in Mali. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you opened it. And it's a thousands of years old, this village, and, yeah. and they, they communicate a lot of their history through the talking drum, and it's very rural. Um, so we go out there, you know, to record and see what they, you know, they want a music school. Well, they don't have water. Mm. So you're like, okay, we would love to build and help you with a music school, but can we first help you with the water? Mm. Um, so, so it opens up, I mean, the challenges are, are not ours. They're mm -hmm. usually, you know, something we can work with with the community, but the, within the communities, their challenges are, mm. are, are, are large mm. as far as. But that's very interesting to hear how you create, uh, I mean, from the uh, core of mm -hmm. wanting to create the music from mm -hmm. the schools and letting that just to able mm -hmm. to make that grow, mm -hmm. all the things around it that you actually need that in some parts of the world obviously are something that you take for granted and you right. don't even think about it, but then yeah, obviously... They were, they were so excited water. to build the school and to help build the school yeah. that in order to make the bricks with mm. which to build the school, the mm. women would walk, you know, two hours to a river. Yeah. Get, you go get in... We were like, what are they doing? And remember those guys that would yeah, dive with down? Yeah, a bucket and a so net. They and would have a boat and then a bucket and a net and they would yeah. dive down, sift the silt from the bottom uh -huh. of the river, come up to the top, get yeah. the water out, use the silt to pack into a brick, yeah. let it dry, then stack them, pull them back with a donkey, and then build the school. Mm. I mean, it was like, un unlike anything I've ever seen in this desire to, you know, to have these, these mm. dwellings and buildings and stuff, but mm. we've since helped them build, dig a couple of wells, and now they have water for the first time in their yeah. buildings and their maternity mm. ward. It's pretty cool. Yeah, and when just challenges, you know, they're more about how do you persevere through them. Mm -hmm. But I remember early on also on that South Africa trip, we were in Soweto, South Africa, and we were recording some musicians. And again, with my iPod, I give it to these two guys next to us. And they look really excited, you know, and then they give me back the iPod and my friend comes over and I thought that they were with us in the group, but they weren't. They were just there. <laughs> and he, he said, Why you know, that? just so you know, those are the gangsters. And usually they would have robbed you and taken your iPod. <laughs> but after watching the video, they decided to protect you guys while you're here. <laughs> so I think a lot of it is about context. You know, yeah. like, why are you there? If you're there for something positive, if you're there for the people, sure. then great things come mm -hmm. out of it. And speaking of great things coming out of it, you know, our very first fundraiser ever mm. was uh, to build our first school. Right. We decided let's assemble all the different great musicians right. we had met throughout all the songs around the world. You know, they never meet in person because we go from place to place and add them. So we said, what would happen if we had put them all together as a band mm. to play a concert? And that created this unbelievable experience, you know, because it's the tangible example of the project. Right in front of you, you see 10 different countries mm. playing music together. You see how easy people get along when the music plays. And you get to feel this energy right in front of you. So that, the f first music school, the first fundraiser led to the creation of the Playing for Change band. Mm -hmm. And now they tour the world as the global ambassadors for the project. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. And with all these programs and schools and the videos and everything that you created these last soon to be 20 years, next year? Oh no, well, you started the ID <laughs> in 2000, 2000. Okay, okay. Um, uh, I mean, with the whole, like in the name, playing for change. Obviously, the, the, the schools and all the kids that are able to play the music. But I'm also thinking on a higher level, being able to change actually like the world without... I mean, when you're saying that, I want to change the world, it feels like you sound so naive, but you're actually, I mean, you are changing the world in some way. And, and what would you say? What, what actual change have you seen through these years in the world with your work? It's a huge question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is a huge question. It is a huge question. 
But, I mean, we get to see change every day. And to be honest, it starts from the inside out. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't go change the world. You change yourself. And then you listen to other people. And together you make something bigger than yourselves. You know, our, one of our heroes is Norman Lear. And Norman had said, there's three things in life that remind us we're all connected. Music, laughter, and transcendence. The idea of being a part of something bigger than yourself. So those have been kind of the tools that we use to change ourselves, change the way we see the world so we can find positive in other people and then connect with them. And then that slowly becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and it becomes a movement around mm. the world. Mm. Yeah, I think our, our project started really, my, okay. Um, it started with the real simple idea of just stopping what you're doing and listening mm. to people. So just stop and listen, stop and listen to the music and it's applied so many different ways and is so um, valid, I think, in the world we live in, especially just to take a minute and listen. And, and, and our project grew from the time we took to listen to what people had to say in their stories. And, and I think that's why there's been people respond to the videos and things because, you know, it was a painstaking process. I mean, we've been doing this a long time. And, and, it, and it's just, you know, to, to listen to people and to really hear what they have to say is the first step, I think, mm. and why the, project, um, why the project exemplifies kind of what we think mm. change can be mm. in the world and how you get there. Mm. And it's like you said, it sounds like naive, but, but it really is, is possible. And we see, we've seen it happen through the videos. We've seen yeah. it happen when, you know, you show back in the day when he used to show, like you said, someone in Africa, a video on the iPod of someone in Nepal, I mean, they couldn't believe it, <laughs> like that they were able to sing the same song and speak yeah. the same metaphorical language. Mm. And now, you know, we have seen it happen, you know, in areas that are, you know, we've seen it happen in, in many ways, mm. you know, with, with women, with kids, with equal rights. I mean, it just opens yeah. the floodgates for these conversations to ha happen, so. Mm. You want to say about Nepal? Oh, yeah. Okay. So this is one of my favorite stories. So um, we uh, had a program in Nepal in um, a tiny village called Tintale. I've unfortunately never been there, but we have an ambassador. Um, his name is William Ora, and he works with a local group in Kathmandu, and they travel out there several times a year. And it's a 12-hour bus ride from Kathmandu and then like a three-hour walk to get to the village. Oh. Really rural. And then you can only get there at certain times of the year with the water and the river uh, that they have to cross. Um, but they had never had, you know, m much education there. And they certainly hadn't had any um, musical education with, with more modern instruments. So um, there was a, a woman in um, Kathmandu, a young woman and a young man that wanted to go with Aura and bring some instruments and see what happened, kind of. So they got out there to, to the village after traveling and they put you know, some instruments, I forget what they were. Do you remember what? They were mostly flutes. They were flutes, that's right, flutes, okay. Flutes, and they brought, all the village came in, who are these people, what are they doing? And they had all of these flutes, and they put the flutes out, and they said, you know, we're bringing these for the kids, you know, who wants to learn how to play? And only little boys came forward. And so, they, the, the girl was really mystified, the woman, Gatman was like, why, to the village elders, was like, why are there only boys? And they were like, well, because only boys play music. And they were like, she was like, well, no, you know, girls can play music too. <laughs> and they were like, no, you know, that's silly. That's ridiculous. You know, we've been here for thousands of years. No girls play music. And she's like, I, I, I swear like, <laughs> girls can play music. Just let one try. And they yeah. were like, really? Yeah. And like a girl came up and picked up the flute and they were like, oh, look at that. Wow. Girls can play. I mean, it was as simple as that yeah. where it was just years and years of not knowing, Yeah, sure. you know, so it was like a huge eye-opening moment for this very small modicum of people, right. but I mean, it's exemplary in how um, easy it is to shift ideas when they're just yeah. sometimes just often long, long-held beliefs. Mm. Um, and, and so that's an, just an awesome, you know, example of yeah. change. Sure. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyways, that's a good story. I'm so curious what happened to the f flute girl. No, oh, they're still playing. <laughs> yeah. They have like a whole program now. Yeah. yeah. They're that's old, much older now, those kids. That was probably 10 years ago. Mm. Yeah. A lot of them are now the teachers. 
Oh, you see. <laughs> so you're receiving this award, which obviously is a huge thing for all your all this work that you've been telling us about. And um, what will happen next with you guys? I'm thinking um, a lot of people will get to know about Playing for Change who maybe have not heard about your work before throughout getting like this type of award, mm -hmm. maybe a new people will uh, start following your work and getting interested in maybe joining the movement right. and everything. So what are you looking forward to in the future for Playing for Change? Well, one thing, just looking back, what's so amazing is so many of our heroes have won the Polar Prize. Mm -hmm. And so you feel at first incredibly humble, so many incredible musicians. But then when you look at the list, you realize, you know, this is our chance to actually, we're not a group of, of two people. We're mm -hmm. ambassadors representing millions of people. So this is a chance to be here representing so many people from so many countries and so many uh, different diversity, but they share the same dream, you know, which is to create a better world for everybody and to reconnect hearts. So I think it's a chance for us first to reflect on why did this happen? Why did we end up being able to get this incredible award? And how can we tap into all the incredible community we built to continue to grow the project? Because there's always going to be more schools to build. There's always going to be more songs to record and more people to connect. So it really never ends. Yeah, yeah we, I think it, it's just an incredible, obviously, opportunity to get in front of, of people um, that we haven't met yet and, and meet and, and ideas come out of these, these sorts of things. And you know, our, our big dream has always been to connect the schools with each other, mm -hmm. to let them share, have cross-cultural exchanges via music, education, technology. So mm -hmm. to be in a summit like this with, like, with all of you wonderful people, I mean, it would be amazing to have some programs in Sweden that connect to our programs in various other parts of the world and, and to continue that and you know, always envision like a, a globe with just like little lights. Remember we had that logo a yeah. lot years ago, like mm -hmm. the, all these connections being made, mm -hmm. you know, that's where the connections of the heart, I think, is where the change comes from. So. Mm -hmm. yep. so Mark and Whitney, thank you so much for having this chat with me and ah, with us thanks. all today and have an amazing time at the whole ceremony. Thank you. And the rest of your stay here in Stockholm. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank, Thank you guys you. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes.